what is the best situation for parents to live together when one is in the independent living category and the other is in the assisted living category? I, I love it. Okay, this is awesome. And uh, I'm going to, I, I want to jump because I want to answer questions. I'm going to jump around here and instead of giving you the college lecture style, style thing. So, Leslie, um, what we're going to, uh, what, what the category of, of housing that you're talking about is um, referred to as a CCRC and a life plan community. You can see it here along with the other ones, and, and I'll make sure to touch on all of these. But what a CCRC life plan community does, it takes independent, assisted, and nursing, and, and now memory care, because just about any place that has assisted and nursing has to have memory care. It puts them all on one campus. The concept here is, is that an individual can move in while they're independent and be cared for through a lifetime. However, this also works out well for a couples that may be in varying stages of health. Now, um, your traditional life plan community is, and, and, I'm, and they come in all shapes and sizes, so don't, the, but your traditional uh, life plan community would want mom and dad to move in while they're active and independent. And that, that's not necessarily out running marathons and playing pickleball, but it might be, you know, decent mobility and cognitive ability. And, and they're there and they're able to sort of navigate the various needs in that community th throughout their time in the community. There, there are, as you can see here, we've got independent living communities, we've got um, assisted and nursing. There are a lot of independent living communities that also provide assisted and memory care and they're, they are more traditional rental arrangements. And this is where I want to jump ahead here to life plans, um, life plan communities. Um, and so um, the, the and, and I don't wanna go too far down the rabbit hole here, but I wanna throw this out to you all so that you can, kind of under, uh, understand this, um, the, the, the life plan communities have in general, three broad contract types. And, and I'll make sure Howard gets this PowerPoint so that you all can look at it, but we also have this in, in source book. And depending on the contract type um, is, will, will basically dictate how large the entry fee is when you move into that community. Um, and uh, I don't, we, we could talk about this at length, uh, but I, I want to just introduce that concept to you and then um, jump back to some of the other questions. And, uh, but, but to answer your question, Leslie, there are a variety of, of options where mom and dad can have varying levels of care. They can live in the same community. It's highly ideal that, that they live in, in that environment because the last thing, you know, the, the struggle is if we're aging in place and our spouse needs memory care, you know, we got to get in the car and go visit them, you know, every day versus living in the same community where I can walk down the hall and visit them in memory care. Also, something that I want to make sure that I talk about today is the topic of solo aging, okay? This is the hottest topic on our weekly discussions, and um, what solo aging is, is basically, um, it, it, it's a, a wide variety of things, but your traditional solo ager, somebody you might say, oh, she's a solo ager, is a, an individual that never married, doesn't have kids or somebody that's widowed and outlived their entire family. So they're basically alone. And there are more solo agers over the age of 65 now than there's ever been in our country. Now, the good thing about solo aging, the solo agers that join our community 
are empowered. They know they need to plan ahead. They they can't rely. They're, they're not, oh, I don't need to worry about this. My daughter will take care of me. You know, that's not in their ingredients. So in general, the solo agers are pretty empowered. But the reason that I'm bringing up the solo aging uh, with Leslie's question about mom and dad, varying levels of health, moving into a community, more than likely, those of us who are married, we are not going to pass away at the same day and the same hour as our, our partner. Um, one of us is going to be solo. And I can tell you from all the interviews that I've done, it is a lot more comfortable being solo agers, transitioning to solo agers while living in one of these senior communities than it is alone at home and going through the mourning and the grief and the navigating the home without your spouse that you've been with for many years. So those are a couple of, um, of, of thoughts there. So um, I can roll back here. Um, but let's see, uh, we got Ed who says, um, I have a great, I, I have great independent living right now, but looking to the future, a move may make sense for social purposes and ease of life. Most of us know, know that, but in a pure economic terms, does that make sense to, to with the high buy-in that the newer continuing cares offer? All right, Ed, I'm going to address this, I promise, okay, because I've got a couple of really creative ways to look at this that I think are going to help you and other folks. But what I think is, is that if I, I jump into housing after I talk a little bit about aging in place, it'll make a little bit more sense. OK, so the first thing that I want to kind of share with you all is we talked about, you know, that smile on our face. So living with purpose. OK, now. I'm 57. When I was 43, I moved in and I lived in five different retirement communities as a resident. And one of the reasons that I did that is, is that I wanted to experience what all of my community members and readers were scared to do. And I wanted to also put this through the test that can these homes be a home to a person, not an older person or a person with disability and, and let you know, awesome, awesome neighborhoods. And I'll share some other insights there. But one of the things that I created when I left the, the that little immersion project was this three-legged stool because most of the people in my who I lived with in these communities, the reason that they were living there is because one or all three legs of this the stool were kind of weak. So for example, getting around. If you live in a car dependent suburban neighborhood and you don't like to drive or you can't drive or you don't wanna drive at night, all of a sudden your purpose is compromised a little bit. If you live in a, three-story colonial and your bedroom is on the top floor and you have, uh, you're going through some rehab, you got a new knee or something like that, all of a sudden your environment is not accessible anymore and your purpose is compromised. And last but not least, a lot of us who are aging in place, one of the reasons that we're aging in place is because of the memories of our home. It's not that it's a practical home anymore. And in fact, the, uh, the, one of the things when I talk to people about this, it's like, what do you love about your home? It's like, oh, I got a great neighborhood. It's like, oh, tell me about your neighbors. And they start telling me about 40 years ago, raising their children and, and talking at the bus stop that the neighborhood connections in our community might not be what you want them to be or what they were or what they could be. And so when those three legs of the stool are weak, that sort of signals that, hey, I got to start looking at some different environments. And wow, okay. So um, I, for whatever reason, my slide deck here is missing a lot of my aging in place stuff, but that's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a couple of um, pointers on aging in place. Okay, so before you start looking at a senior living community, which we're gonna dive into here in a moment, 
I want you all to think about a couple of things. Yeah, grab bars, universal design, putting a first floor master bedroom, you know, converting a room, all that stuff is great stuff that you need to do. But I want you to think a, a little bit more basic. The first thing that I want you to think about is your network, your network of support, because aging in place, unlike moving to a senior living community, aging in place takes a network of support. So I, for those of you who have been in business before, I want you to think about this as a CRM. For those who are not familiar with that, in business, we all have CRMs and it has all of our business contacts and we can access it at any point in time. I got to tell you, I've been doing this for 33 years. Nobody creates a CRM for their personal network, but I want you to start thinking about that and doing that as part of your plan. Your family, your friends, your neighbors, your pastor, the, the hobbies you enjoy, the person that, that walks your dog or grooms your dog. These are our, all part of our network. And if we have health changes, they're going to all be important components. Because listen, if you've got a dog that you love and something happens and your, your health changes and you're living at home, you got to be able to easily tell somebody, call Cindy. She's the dog walker and the groomer and she can take care of Fido. Okay, so taking a personal inventory of your network and thinking about, you know, the different roles that you could see people playing and identify weaknesses and strengths and have conversations with people in the in, in that network as well. Um, and this is really essential if you're a solo ager to do this inventory. Um, also, some of the people on in this network are going to intersect with your legal documents. And I know if you're a, a, a client of Howard and the firm, that they're going to, on a regular basis, say, you know, you got your advanced care, power of attorney, estate planning, and all that stuff. But make sure that you have it's one thing about, hey, I want you to write a check if I if I can't make decisions for myself, but it's another thing sort of talking about what those decisions might look like. That can be really helpful. Oh, and um, CRM stands for Customer Relationship Manager, okay? Um, you can say Rolodex. This is probably the one this is probably the one group you can you could yeah Rolodex. Rolodex is it's like your black book you know I mean it's it, it's that's what it is so the um but so so that's the first thing okay for aging in place having that in place now the the next thing I'm going to talk about it's not grab bars home care agencies adult daycare all that type of stuff I'm going to talk about one very simple but difficult thing screwing a light bulb into the ceiling of your house, okay? I want you to imagine that if your mobility was compromised, that if your husband wasn't around, um, who is going to change the light bulb in the ceiling in one of your rooms? Is it going to be you? Okay, that's okay. Um, but what if your health changed and it was difficult to get up on a ladder or scary or not safe to get up on a ladder to change that light bulb? Um, who would you call? So I, I, I like bringing this home maintenance example up to emphasize one of the most important things to aging in place is home maintenance and doing it safely and, um, and functionally. So Think about my light bulb example is, is that um, there's a lot that can happen there. Number one, we could just let the light bulb burn out. Well, that's not a purposeful way to live in our home. Number two, we could jump on a ladder, even though we're a little scared and try to change it and we fall, we could be in the hospital and next thing you know, you're in a, in a nursing home. And I like bringing up the light bulb because that intersects with your network. You know, there's a you, you you got tons of people you can call to change your your um to update your AC unit, clean your gutters, shovel your snow, this that and the other. It's this little light bulb thing that makes it a a, a, a more real example. 
And this is kind of, I'm saying this tongue in cheek, but I like sharing this example. The example that a lot of people use to change that light bulb or move a couch from one side of the room to the other is they order a Domino's pizza. And uh, let's see, I got a $20 bill, right? Oh, $50 bill. And when the pizza delivery guy comes, they got a nice little $50 bill. And it's like, hey, son, can uh, you change this light bulb and move my, my sofa for me? That's great. The kid's going to be happy. He gets a great tip. You, you're happy. It gets done. Here's the other thing. That kid had better be honest because if he's not honest, he's going to go back to the place and say, hey, I know an older adult that lives alone and she loves me. And, uh, you know, fraud is being committed against seniors at, at an alarming rate. So we need to protect ourselves. So that is, I know I kind of babbled on, I can go into great, much greater detail on the different services that you can access to age in place if you've got healthcare changes. But those two things will get you started and it'll unlock a dialogue with your network, with yourself to sort of make modifications to, to better age in place. But let's say that you, like some of the people that are on the call today, let's say that you decide, you know what? I don't know if this home is going to be safe and accessible. And oh, the other thing that I'm going to add, when aging in place is not a good idea, and this is probably going to be more of your parents than anybody on this call right now, is when you're lonely and isolated at home. We, it, Surgeon General, screamed it from the headlines a couple of weeks ago. Loneliness and isolation is not healthy. Okay. So, if you are saying, I want to age in place, and this is a real thing, reason why people say they want to age in place. I want to age in place because I host Thanksgiving dinner every year. Where are the kids going to go if I don't, if I sell the home and I move away? I got to stay here because of Thanksgiving dinner. Okay. So even though 364 days out of the year, it's kind of lonely and isolating and the home is too big and what have you. Um, one of the key determinants is, is that loneliness and isolation. Aging in place is great. Okay, we can do it. But if it's not a healthy environment, if it's not a safe environment, then we should look at other places. So now let's talk about those other places. We already talked a little bit about life plan communities. But before we do that, I'm going to prep you because I like keeping you positive. This, this age segregated housing can be really depressing and negative, okay? Even though I've made my living in it, even though these places are wonderful and if when folks move in, they're happy, but I'm telling you, I'm not ready yet. It's that phrase that I hear. So one of the tips that I give people, and it works, okay, is I tell them, you're not taking mom to go see an old folks home. Tell her you're going to look at the next college that she's gonna go to, okay? And 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 you're not doing this like this is an uh, a, a philosophical exercise. Okay, we're not we're not trying to trick somebody that they're going to University of Michigan when they're going to Shady Acres. But what I want the point is the mindset that you need to be in is the same as a high school senior that's touring colleges where he or she is going to go. And here's why. When a kid goes onto a college campus, he doesn't care about the square footage of his dorm room. He doesn't care that it doesn't have granite countertops and that it might look a little bit differently than the home he grew up in. He's looking at pretty much one thing, at the other students that are walking around that campus. Do I want to party and hang out with these folks for the next four years? Okay, that's what most college kids are saying. Now, the ones that really like to study, they are also looking at the faculty. So when you go into these communities, I want you to look at the students, the other residents that are living there, and I want you to look at the faculty. That's the people that work there. But more importantly, what I want you to do, and this is either if you're doing it for yourself or you're doing it for your mom and dad or, or your next door neighbor, is make a list of all the things that you're interested in when you go to before you go and visit these communities. And when you're setting up the tour, what I urge people to do is say to that marketing person, 
we're real excited to come uh, to the uh, to 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 visit. I'm bringing my mom, and I just uh, let me tell you a little bit about my mom. She's a retired school teacher. She likes playing mahjong. She uh, goes to the any town Baptist church. Um, she collects Beanie Babies. When she was younger, she volunteered all the time, you know, helping uh, doing English as a second language. I just sort of came up with that scenario off the top of my head. So now the, the challenge that you're going to give the marketing and admissions is, it's like when we come and visit, if there's anybody that you think that my mom might get along with, it would be great to sit down and have a cup of coffee or meet them. And so now when mom comes into the building and sees somebody with a wheelchair or walker, and that's going to scare her away, but then one of those people that rolls up in the wheelchair just happens to be a retired school teacher that goes to the same church that collects Beanie Babies and likes playing Mahjong, all of a sudden, mom's not looking at this person like a they're in a wheelchair and I'm not. They're looking at, this could be my new best friend. And when I'm living alone, how do I get to any of my friend's house? I got to get in the car and drive. She's right down the hall from me. This is going to be awesome. Okay, I'm trying to paint a, a little more positive picture than you're than you're used to, but um, but so let's let's dive into this. Okay, um, okay. So um, let me go back to this slide, and I'm going to talk about all the different senior living options that are available outside of the home. So we talked about aging in place and aging in community. And actually, we talked about aging in place. That's staying put. I'm going to talk about aging in community. So what I want you to think about, let's say that you or your loved ones went out and toured a bunch of places and you're still saying, no way, I don't want to move to one of those places, but our home is too big and I'd like to have a more maintenance-free lifestyle. There is something in between. I call them smart lifestyle communities, but basically what they are is apartment buildings that are in walkable neighborhoods that are, have accessibility to amenities that, um, that you need. And I'll tell you, the main amenity that we all need is a grocery store. So for example, I think most of you are in Northern Virginia and I know Howard's office is in Tyson's. There's an apartment building over in Tyson's with a Harris Teeter in the bottom. I live in Reston. There's another apartment building with a big Wegmans in the bottom. And usually these, these apartment buildings are really close to restaurants and culture and the Metro and all that type of stuff. So the ability to downsize and live a car free or a less car dependent lifestyle and have a grocery store where you can pick up your groceries whenever you want to and go to a restaurant. This is a, the, the concept of aging in community. So I am living in Vienna right now and I, the home's too big. I'm not ready to move to a senior living community. Maybe my first step is one of these smart lifestyle communities and I can see how it works. And if you're nervous about this and, and, and you've got the finances, maybe you don't even sell the home. Maybe you go and you try this out. And if it doesn't work, you move back to your house, okay? So the next official senior living type of community is called an active adult community. And in an active adult community, most of them are purchased, or, um, communities where you're purchasing a, a home or a condo in a gated community. And um, there's lots of clubs. Everybody there is 55 plus, And um, it's sort of like a country club for older adults. These are great options. However, they don't have healthcare provided. So if healthcare did change, you'd be in the same boat that you are in your home. You'd either need to bring in help like a home care agency, or you'd need to move to go to a memory care community. Um, just so you know, usually, so Leisure World, Lansdowne Woods, Heritage Hunt, these are probably some of the active adult communities you're familiar with. 
it's no surprise that outside the gates of all these communities now, there are assisted livings, memory care, nursing homes that are built because there's a high concentration of older adults and a percentage might need those types of services. So the next category of housing after uh, in, active adult is independent living. These are primarily independent living senior apartment buildings, okay, for folks that are living independently. Now, there's a lot of different types of these. Number one, there are are um, a decent amount of subsidized independent living communities that are out there for seniors. If you know anybody that might qualify for a subsidy and that might be something you see in their future, tell them to get on a waiting list as soon as possible. Before, because when they want to move, they're gonna have to wait two years. So get on a two year waiting list so that you can get accepted to that program for the subsidized program. On the other side, side of the equation, there are some incredibly luxurious independent living senior apartment communities that are out there. And uh, they're, they're being built every day around the Beltway. Um, most of these are affiliate, will have assisted living and memory care, you know, like a floor, because they know that the people who are moving in don't want to move again and so it's much better that they can just move to a different part of that community. Um, so then the next category of housing is called assisted living. It's designed for people who aren't capable of living independently, but don't need the level of care provided in a nursing home. This fills a big gap. My, my grandfather, 33 years ago, when he was in a nursing home, assisted living really didn't exist. So that's why you hear nursing homes sometimes referred to as long-term care facilities because people actually used to live in nursing homes for many years. There's a handful that do, but now long-term care is primarily provided in assisted living. Nursing homes, which is the next category, are primarily where we go for short-term care. And most of us, if we ever need a nursing home, it's going to be something led us to the hospital, a fall, a healthcare problem. The doctor writes a prescription and says, Mr. Gurney, you need to get better and get some rehab. And I recommend that you go to this skilled nursing center. You can get it at home, but you're gonna get more intense rehab and get better quicker if you go to the nursing home. So I go and I get better. And now I'm discharged back to my home or discharged to an assisted living if my mobility or my activities of daily living are compromised. And then the last category that I have already introduced you to combines all three of these together, independent, assisted, and nursing, puts them all on one campus. So the concept is that we can be cared for a lifetime. There is one other category that's part of assisted living and that's memory care. So for example, if somebody has Alzheimer's or dementia, a lot of times their body is healthy, so they don't qualify to go into a skilled nursing center. Um, so the, 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 the category of memory care is largely um, an assisted living category focused on the needs of people with memory impairment. Um, okay, um, Howard, I'm looking at the clock. It's a quarter to one. Um, I'd, I'd love it if anybody wants me to expand on any of the items that I've I've talked about. I can rattle on about a lot of stuff for a long time, but um, but if there's any questions, I'll I'll definitely take those up. All right. So yeah, so let's see if there's any questions while we're waiting. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I know you threw up a slide about the three types of contracts, maybe yeah. a bit about, yeah, about okay. that. Okay, so here, here we go. So life plan contract types. So again, every one of these life plan communities is a little bit different, but, um, but these are in general, the three types. So type A, has an entrance fee and a monthly fee, and it's all inclusive. And when you move to healthcare, your monthly service fee does not change. 
and they've got a nonprofit benevolence care clause. So how I want you to view this one, and usually this type A is where you might have a larger entry fee because basically, and, and think of that entry fee as it's like an insurance policy, but you're paying your premium in one big payment, okay? And you go in here and you've got your entrance fee and you've got a consistent monthly fee that uh, will carry through for the most part whether you're an independent assisted or nursing. And then um, in addition, there's a benevolence clause in that if you move in when you're 85, but live to 110 and you outlive all of your money, this community is not going to kick you to the curb. They know exactly how much money you came in with. They know that you put this entry fee down and that's Part of that entry fee is to cover your care if you need it, okay? So that's the type A contract. Um, all right, um, and I see some other questions, but let me get through these two other contract types. So then type B is an entry fee and a monthly fee that is generally less than type A, okay? M meaning uh, usually the entrance fee is lower, the monthly fee might be a little bit higher. The services and amenities at every level, defined insurance coverage. When you move to healthcare, your monthly service fees increase per level, but it'll be below market rate. So um, let's say that the type A, and I'm just throwing this out there, let's say that it's your monthly fee is $2,500 a month, and it's that going assisted in nursing. But Type B, maybe you start out at $2,500 a month in independent living, but then your monthly fee for assisted living, because you have to go there, is $4,000 a month. But for most of you who've done a little bit of research, $4,000 a month is uh, very affordable compared to the market rate assisted living that's out there. So type A is uh, a, little bit, a little bit lower but um, the monthly fees can go up uh, than then type, type B or type A. And then type C has the lowest entry fee. Um, there's the monthly service fee. It can be month to month rental, no insurance coverage in healthcare. And it's, um, so think of type C is pretty much almost like a la carte. You're, you're living on a campus that has independent assisted and nursing but you're paying each of those monthly fees. But the benefit is, is that you're on this campus where they're all there. So again, the husband and wife, if the husband's in independent living and the wife is in memory care or nursing, they still get to live in the same community. Um, okay, let's see. Um, now, uh, Dean has a question here. It says, what do you say about loss of equity when you sell your home and move into a CCRC. Do you need long-term care in a CCRC? Okay, um, I'm I'm a generalist in this area, Dean. Uh, but and I recommend that these are scenarios that you run the financial scenarios of the equity loss and things like that. Run those by the team, uh, Howard, and the team. Uh, okay, but let me answer your question about the long-term care insurance in a CCRC. When you go to these life plan communities and, and all these places, if you have a long-term care insurance policy, make sure that you bring it with you and let them know that you've got it. Many of these life plan communities have, a, have adjustments in their fees based on the fact that a resident is not going to need to um, draw on the, uh, the agreement as much with a long-term care insurance policy, and it's, it stretches out your dollars. What, what a lot of people have seen is, is that, however, is, is that um, even in a type A environment, if you are moving to the nursing home section of that building, you still have a monthly fee that monthly fee, which was your rent in independent living, has now shifted to a healthcare expense 
that can enable your long-term care insurance policy to pay for it. And so now your, your long-term care insurance po policy may be paying for your monthly, your entire monthly fee in a life plan community, which gives you more assets that will go to your, um, your, your estate. Okay. Um, I, just, I just want to throw out, you know, and, and, you know, in, in terms of Dean's question about equity, many of these communities will refund uh, the buy-in or, or a, not the whole buy-in, but a big percentage of that buy-in at your passing. So if you leave or you, you pass away, a lot of times your, your beneficiaries will receive 80, 90% of your buy-in, uh, assuming that you didn't go through it, you know, in higher costs, you know, through your, your time there, right? That's correct, right, Steve? Yeah, yeah. And then also, and, and they're all a little bit different, um, you know, so just just tr understand the contract and, you know, you can reach out to me or Howard if you're confused and there's people we can connect you to or we can, you, you know, help you, you know, look at the agreement or what have you. Um, Patrick, for your question on cost, one of the cool things is in the source book, if you, you all order the source book and I'll I'll drop the um, either reach out to Howard or I'll, I'll drop our order. Um, uh, link into the uh, into chat. We we have an overview of the costs in um, in sourcebook at all these places. Uh, so that'll give you an idea when you uh, when you get that. So um, I'm dropping this in uh, to chat here uh, for everyone. There we go. Um, I'm also going to drop in my contact info because I know we're getting um, close to the hour. So if I don't answer something that you want answered, then feel free to reach out to me. Um, so I love this question here. So moving in, moving into a new area, what is the best way to establish an entirely new network? All right, I love this question, and um, we've got a. Uh, We've got a group on this networking thing. We're 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 feel free to send me an email because we're putting together these little working groups that are trying to sort of build out their networks. And there are several people in our first group that are moving to another area and they're sort of like, okay, I got a network here in Northern Virginia, but now I'm gonna move to Arizona. What do I do? And here's my quick Monday morning quarterbacking thing on this. And this is something that we should all do. Remember how I said, make a list of all the things you're interested in when you move into, a, when you're touring senior living communities. This is the best way to um, build your entirely new network in this new region that you're moving moving to. And, and one of the easy things that you can do, or shouldn't say easy, one of the things you can do is, so for example, let's say, that you've got a Shetland Sheepdog and you're a part of the Shetland Sheepdog Club here in Northern Virginia, and you attend the XYZ Baptist Church, reach out to your pastor at the church and say, hey, I'm moving to Arizona. Do you have any affiliates that are in Arizona that could connect me with a church there? So now you're getting the red carpets getting rolled out. You got a pastor calling another pastor saying, hey, one of our members is coming and she's great and she does X, Y, and Z. So that could open up a whole new network to you before you even land in the new area. And then the Shetland Sheepdog example is that if you're part of that club here, you know, find out through your club who's running the club there. Now, here's the cool thing. I did this brainstorming exercise with somebody else. She had a hobby and it wasn't in her new area. I was like, guess what? You get to start the club. You get to start the Shetland Sheepdog Club in Phoenix, Arizona. And start now you go there with purpose. You're going to pet stores and vets and things like that. Hey, I'm going to start the new chapter here in Phoenix for the Shetland Sheepdog Club. It, your question on that is very valid. In fact, as I had mentioned, our discussions that we um that we have on solo aging many of those discussions with the solo agers migrate to making friends okay and and understand why this happens is is that for example 
a solo ager, I, there was the gentleman on one of our calls and he says, my wife was the, my wife was the cruise ship director. She is the person that um, helped me make all of my friends that I've, that I've got. And now she's gone and I need to learn how to make friends again. And, and we sort of have go through these various process uh, to do that. Um, one of the things dot com, by the way, I've got, a, I've had several clients who have had uh, very good experiences using meetup.com uh, yep. as a way to find people with shared interests and, you know, connect with them uh, uh, in new areas. So that's all, that's oh. always a great resource as well. Also another thing to let you all know about there and here, I'll put it into chat. It's um, uh, senior planet. Um, let me get it here, seniorplanet.org. Um, it's part of AERP. It is absolutely incredible, incredible way to meet and uh, get connected to people. They have online classes in some areas. They have uh, in-person classes. But um, I have talked to so many people that have gone to these Senior Planet classes and they have friends now all over the world that are, you know, um, uh, you know, they're doing bar or Tai Chi or strength and stability class. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with y'all, this is our website. It's, um, I'm, I'm dropping it into chat. It's um, every week we have discussions, live and interactive discussions and uh, on a lot of the topics that we're talking about today. So for example, tomorrow, we're talking to the author of The Busy Caregiver's Guide to Advanced Alzheimer's Disease. And um, the, um, we've got recordings of all of these here, over 300 of them, but um, these are just a great way to really think outside the box, also connect with a few uh, new people and, um, uh, you know, expand your horizons. That's great, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody, uh, on behalf of myself, Howard Pressman, and the staff and advisors here at EBW, I really appreciate, Steve, you taking your time to spend it with us, giving us a great overview. I know there's a lot of information to try and go through in an hour, but we really just wanted to give, uh, give you all a you know, a basic primer of, of what some of the options are out there. Out there. there are a lot of choices, a lot of acronyms and so forth. And, uh, you know, we wanted to try and help cut through uh, some of the ambiguity. Uh, I definitely encourage you to visit Steve's website. Uh, I do it frequently. Uh, I utilize this source book here myself. It is a great resource. Steve is a wonderful resource. And I encourage you to, to reach out, connect, uh, so much there to offer. So yeah, again, and Howard, I'll uh, I'll send you a box of the new ones. Awesome, thank you very much. Yeah, Steve used to be in our building, and that was very easy. <laughs> yeah, just walk upstairs. Yeah, so, exactly. Well. But uh, in any event, thank you all very much for spending your lunch hour with us. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions, reach out to your advisor here at EBW. We'll be glad to assist you, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care. All right. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye bye. Have a great day.